It turns out, a few years ago, like a few centuries ago, like a few millennia ago, there was a guy, Archimedes, living around, and he walked out to the bathtub yelling, Eureka, Eureka. Now, this might be the first recorded moment of humans discovering something absolutely new and putting it down in a single phrase. Indeed, invention that Archimedes experienced happened in a split second. It happened in a moment, but if that invention is meant to change the world, it might take a decade or more for it to transfer into something that can be given at scale and a million people can truly appreciate it. That particular challenge often is missed. As scientists and engineers, we spend a lot of time discovering new ideas, and we are absolutely delighted with that moment that if something happens in the lab, we publish a paper, we are done. Well, actually, that's just the beginning of a journey that's about to begin. How long is that journey? Well, let's take a look. Maybe by looking through history of what has been done before. It turns out that if you look at one of, the very early, or one of the early examples that we might be simply able to comprehend, we might come up with a very, very powerful technology of the zipper. It replaced the buttons. It changed the ways that we fasten our shirts. Actually, the very first time it was used, it was on boots. Gosh, rather than lacing those boots, I can simply zip them up. Technology was invented in 1800s, first useful patent in 1912, but it took till 1925 for a million boots to truly appreciate having being zipped. An innovation journey of about a dozen years. Well, why so long? <laughs> Zipper is not a very complex technology. Well, it's not very complex if you happen to have a machine that can precisely put one mechanical part next to another mechanical part with the accuracy over and over again and hence consequently make the zippers affordable for everyone to actually experience. The foundry of making the zipper was missing, and it was required in order for us to be able to scale this particular innovation. The particular story repeats itself as you keep going through the 20th century. In the middle of the 20th century, there was another technology, <laughs> a Velcro. Fantastic technology invented by a scientist who was observing the burrs sticking to the fur of his dog and thinking, gosh, if I can just make a little loop and another little loop, they can catch each other and I can make a very powerful fastener to replace the zipper and the button. It took 13 years to scale this technology. Why? Because plastics in the middle of the 20th century are a brand new idea. Extruding plastics to make fibers in an affordable way for everyone to use, a brand new idea. You need a foundry for making such objects in order to truly make a transformational change. And of course, you can look at this and say, well, this is you know early 20th, middle 20th century. Can you give me something a little bit newer? Well, all right, fine. How about the actual electronics technology that's right now in every chip that you use? In the 1990s, Judy Hoyt recognized that if you strain silicon, add a little germanium in it to make the atoms of silicon spread ever so slightly, you'll make faster transport of charge through that silicon wafer. And it took about 13 years for this technology to be adapted and scaled into actual chips that all of us benefit from. Even more recent, a technology of so-called Chi-K dielectrics was developed, where very simply, you want to lower the voltage of your transistors, and you can by using these high dielectric materials, introduce them into your chips. That's all you need to do, change one material. It took over a decade for that technology as well to become real and for all of us to use. If you look throughout the history of changing inventions into scalable innovations, it's a decade or more that is needed. You need typically a foundry that's missing, that is enabling you to use entirely new material sets in new ways in order to be able to make that impactful technologies that people never had before. So let me show you another one that's an even more <laughs> recent one, utilizing, well, unusual material sets that now all of you utilize every day, or many of you at least. It starts with this. It's a pickle. 
if you spear it with two electrodes and apply 100 volts, it's going to glow. You're electrically exciting atoms of the pickle to generate luminescence. Now, if you slice the pickle very, very thin and replace atoms with molecules, you can apply 5 volts and get yourself what is now known as an organic light-emitting display, an OLED. Most of your phones, when you stare at them, you're looking at those glowing pickle molecules, or at least a different kind of a molecule that gives you the particular grow, the red, red, reds, the greens, the blues, as you need them. That particular impact of that technology took Mayer 25 years to scale, from the basic demonstrations in the 1980s to what became now millions of people utilizing them. And what took really a turn for the better in this story was the engagement of startup companies. Companies who realized that if only if we can make this real, the world will be more energy efficient and display technologies will be much more pro pro proliferating throughout the planet. The company that I have in mind to tell you about is called Kativa. A young company back in 2008, when they were formed, with the idea that they need to invent a new technology to actually manufacture OLEDs extremely rapidly, so-called yield jet. In mere eight years, <laughs> they generated technology like this, a printer that is able to deposit over and over again, in a very rapid fashion, molecules or packaging material for molecules. By 2016, this particular tool was used to encapsulate 100 million cell phones. A new foundry to utilize molecules in ways that had never been used before. Now imagine what else is out there, and maybe rather than asking you to imagine it, I'll show you one more example. A recent technology that you might have heard about is so-called colloidal quantum dots, so little chunks of stone that happen to glow of any color of the rainbow. Just choose the size of the dot you wish. And if you have it, and you want to make a really good looking light bulb, well, go ahead and uh, incorporate it in those light bulbs. It did take 30 years for this technology to become real, but now you can see it in a store near you. This particular technology was first utilized to replace an incandescent light bulb. If you look at an incandescent light bulb illuminating a bowl of fruit, Everything looks perfectly nice. If you want to have a more efficient light bulb, you will use an LED light. But the typical LED light doesn't have the right colors in it. As a result, your bananas don't look quite as appetizing under an LED light bulb. But an LED light with a quantum dot layer on top, you can recover the colors you wish for and generate a perfect color spectrum device, much more importantly, extremely efficient device, five times more efficient than an incandescent light bulb. Electricity used for lighting consumes about 20% of, of the electricity of the world. Giving you a more efficient light bulb is a significant advancement for the betterment of the planet. This particular technology, of course, in a light bulb can make you a little bit of money, but if you're a startup company, you're looking for an opportunity that can truly allow you to grow. Q Division, again, a few MIT alums starting an idea, decided that you should introduce the technology in a TV sets. And by 2016, they were acquired by Samsung. Today, you can buy their technology. It's called QLEDs. Much improved since those days of their, just their development. But the essence of using a colloidal quantum dot inside a TV set to give you an image like very few have made before, indeed, is fundamentally using new materials at scale in a foundry that never existed before. If you would like a Nobel Prize for it, you can also get that. It turns out. This year, uh, October <laughs> this year, Professor Munji Bawendi here in the chemistry department of MIT together with uh, Louis Bruce, Alexei Ekimov were recognized for recognizing 30 years ago that colloidal quantum dots can indeed change the world. And all those startup activities in the middle allowed you to go ahead and make a change. So here's a question. I just showed you a ways of changing the world by using entirely new material scale, of course, this is a very valuable and powerful new technology that any venture capitalist should invest in, right? Well, <laughs> let's take a look at the venture capital investments in a hard tech technologies. Less than 1% of the venture capital investments actually goes into startups that make these physical innovations 
that change the planet 10 years from now. Well, why is that? Well, because they're not financially the best investment. They require a mere $100 million in about 10 years. So trust me, give me $100 million now, and you know, in 2033, I'll make sure it becomes a billion for you. Really, trust me, it's going to work. There's a very small chance you'll necessarily be able to give me that kind of support. And as a result, many, many, many of the fantastic ideas of today, we are choosing not to scale. Mind you, we need 10 years to scale them to save the planet, if for whatever reason we try to advance them for. But it turns out the only way forward is to ask a question, is there a way for me to make a technology faster? Make it not 10 years, but maybe five, because then I might become investable. That's a hard question to ask. <laughs> and it's a hard one to answer, but there might be a solution. And actually, it sits just around the corner, one of many solutions just like it. There are plenty of academic open spaces. One of them is just a two-minute walk from here called MIT Nano that anyone can walk into. And right now, MIT Nano, for example, supports over a hundred different companies doing their work side by side with the academics. These are amazingly good places to change the paradigm of the challenges that the startups face. You often hear that startups have valleys of death they need to cross. There are actually three valleys of death for them to cross. The first one is the valley of death of an idea. Finding a partner who really trusts in you is going to give you that seed to develop that idea to begin. The next is the value of that of the prototype. Being able to have someone who's willing to give you enough money to make a first box that looks like the object you're trying to make millions of. And the last is actually getting that last investment for the scale up, to be able to build something truly transformational for everyone. The success going from the over the first value of that, maybe one in 10 really good ideas will get funded. Next round, of the remaining ones, maybe a quarter will keep on going. And lastly, a third of the remaining ones will get to over here. What I'm really telling you is that only less than 1% of really good ideas get to the place where you can actually see them scale. Now, the journey is 10 years long and 100 million bucks. How do we change it? Well, access to the existing standard available tools in academic settings can do it. How? If there is a tool, you do not need to build a chemical hood or buy a liquid nitrogen tank or hire a chemical engineer to manage your chemical safety. You can use the spaces that already exist. We can fill those values of death, not completely, but dramatically. And as a result, allow you through the process of linking the academic open facilities to startup needs, we can make many more startups reach that stage of, of scale-up. Not, not every one of them will succeed, but many more will have a chance to attempt to, to succeed. And through that, build a better world. Thank you.